Okay, that looks like that's taken care of. Um, just to go back here, I'm just going to hit my back button here. Oops. And down here underneath on our SSDT meetings and trainings page, we do have a training material section um, regarding classic and the redesign. So if I click on to the redesign training, this is basically train the trainer materials for you guys. And so basically you're able to um, use these PowerPoints um, for your own use. Um, you can download those, tweak them, you know, add stuff, remove stuff. Um, so a lot, I did update the PowerPoint. I did not get to the exercises yet. Um, so, you know, you can take those exercises and you know, make modifications to them, whatever works for you. But I was not able to uh, get those updated in time. So, um, but the overview PowerPoint is basically what we're covering in three days. So um, there's a section in there, the stuff that we're going to cover. It's just, it's a very, very basic overview presentation. It doesn't get into all the details. Uh, that's what we have the documentation for. Um, so anything that you need more information, um, you would want to use that through um, uh, the documentation. I am getting some feedback here. Um, make sure that you are muted, please. If not, I might have to just mute everybody. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over now to my demo session here, log in. Okay. And so this is just basically um, SSDTs are test land data. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, and start with budgeting. So this might take a little bit just to get through this. But just a heads up too, we are going to be doing a budgeting session for the ITC fiscal staff um, on April 10th is that Friday with fiscal webinars, April 10th. So we will be going through budgeting at there as well. So this will be um, more of an overview and we'll get into the nitty gritties of it um, more on that day. But just to get you guys familiar with it here. So under budgeting, you're going to see two different options. You're going to be seeing a scenarios option and a proposed amount. So the scenarios is where you're creating your, basically your budgeting worksheets. Um, and so you could have scenarios, um, one really one scenario for each year or possibly two. Um, in my example here, what I have are my scenarios from where it says fiscal year 20 budgets when I first did my budgets earlier this year. And when we are going to go in and create budgets for next fiscal year, I can use my setup underneath this fiscal year 20 budgets. And if I just view this, you're gonna see several worksheets underneath it. What's nice about that is that they can break this down. They can have several worksheets within their budgets. Um, so within that budgeting scenario. So for the example, this, these are my fiscal year 20 worksheets, basically. So I could have a worksheet just for the cafeteria accounts. I could have one for general fund. I could have one for my student activities, for my grants. Um, I can, they can even get more uh, descriptive if they want to and say these are my budgeting worksheet for my administrators, for the um, elementary or the junior high for the high school. So they could divide it up by buildings if they want to and create as many budgeting sheets as they want for this one scenario. And what's nice is once they have this set up, see this nice little clone button here? They can take that and clone that into their fiscal year 21 budgets. And it will take all of those worksheets and copy them over. So um, it does a lot of the work for them. If they know that they're doing these standard, standard budgeting sheets every year and they just want to take it and copy it to the next year, they can do that. So we'll go through that here in a little bit. But for now, I'm just going to X out of here and talk about the other ones that you're seeing here. I also have a fiscal year 20 adjustments um, scenario. So what this is doing then 
is allowing me to go in and make any adjustments that I need to, maybe before the end of the year. Um, you can go in to core into budgets and do um, manually do adjustments for each budget account code by doing a budget transaction. Or if there are, you know, maybe a section, I go here and view this adjustments and I'm adjusting administrative accounts. Um, then I can go in and create the scenario and with those specific accounts. And what happens then is I can go in then and load that into the proposed amounts. Now, whatever I have hanging out there underneath proposed, so we'll go back up here, my proposed amounts. Whatever's hanging out here right now, and, and it could be from when I did my original budgets last fall, when I go in and promote a new scenario, it's going to override what's ever in here. So all of this information is going to be gone, and it's just going to show the administrative ones. So every time you promote, it's going to wipe out what's in here, set up new proposed area. So this is kind of like my working area. And then when I'm ready, then I can take this and apply it. And depending on what I select underneath the apply option, for example, if I'm doing adjustments, I'm gonna do an adjustment when I apply it. And it's basically going to do additions and deductions to those accounts to change my expendable figure, okay? So let me backtrack here, go back to scenario. And in order to create a scenario, you're going to click on create. And when you do that, it's going to ask you for the scenario name, a description, just what fiscal year, and this is just um, an FYI thing, it's not going to have any bearing. Um, it's just going to say that these are tied to fiscal year 2021 or 2020 if I'm doing adjustments, 2021 if I'm doing next year proposed amounts. And then from here, I can start creating budgeting sheets within this scenario. Now I'm gonna open up the one scenario that we've already started and I can add to it. So fiscal year 20 adjustments, I'm gonna go ahead and open this up. And so you see the one budgeting sheet that I have already created and it's administrative administration adjustments. Um, <clears throat> and so we can go in and view that one, and we'll do that in a little bit, or I can go in and create another uh, budgeting sheet for this scenario. So I could go ahead and upload one. So that's uploading an outside spreadsheet, excuse me, outside spreadsheet that I have oh, um, uh, in Excel, and I can pull that in here or I can create um, a new one here. So if I click on create, it's going to create a spreadsheet within the budgeting scenario. So if they, you know, if your districts do ask, hey, I have these spreadsheets already set up, you know, sitting out there in Excel, can I just take those and pull them in? Yes, they can use the upload option. It does have to be formatted a certain way. So we've got that information in the documentation, um, but, this is another easy way to create the worksheet within this uh, option. So I'm going to click on create. And the first thing that it's going to ask me for is, is this a budget type or a revenue? So let's pick on, I always pick on cafeteria. Let's say we're going to update some um, budget amounts in the cafeteria. So I just want to deal with expenditure type of things. So I'm going to leave my select type as budget. And then from there, it's pulling up um, right here, all the different that are going to UUI ID um, that's, can, that's talking to the system. So you just kind of want to ignore that um, <clears throat> and leave that go. But um, it's going to include the description of the budget account all of the dimensions of that budget account. And then I've got um, fields that have pulled in prior year expendable. If I don't want prior expendable, it's not going to be useful for me. I can just delete this out of um, my uh, spreadsheet. It won't be in there. Prior expended, yeah, I do want that one. 
Um, my current year expendable and my current year expended, definitely my encumbrance and my unencumbered balance. So these are the ones that by default we have in here. If I wanted to pull some other fields, I just go over to my properties and I select them. So let's say I also want to include, let me look here, how about um, two years prior expended? I want to include that and maybe even three years. I'm just double clicking on them <coughs> to add them. <coughs> and I can take, <coughs> excuse me, and even take like my prior year expended and move it down here so that just sliding it down with my mouse so that it's all, it's being stubborn. There we go. Um, and just sliding it all so my three prior years expended amounts are all grouped together in the same area. And so from here, like I said, if I wanted to get rid of, rid of some of these, maybe I don't want my encumbrance and my unencumbered balances in here. And I really don't want prior expendable either. So I've just got my current year expended and expendable and my last three years, kind of similar to what we had in Classic. Um, and so I've got my account code, I got the description. So I've got all the fields I need on my spreadsheet. But now I want to filter because if I don't go and filter, it's going to pull all my budget accounts. And I just want the cafeteria fund. So when I click on config, configure filters, I'm going to hold the whole new section proper properties that I can choose from. First thing I want to do is make sure that I'm just selecting active accounts. So I'm going to make this active equals true. I just want my active accounts. I don't want to be budgeting against accounts that aren't, that I'm not using, that are um, inactive. And the other thing I want to do as well is I want to go in and filter by the cafeteria fund. So I'm going to go to code and I'm going to pick just fund equals 006. So I've got all my properties I want. I've filtered on the properties that I want. And now I'm going to create the sheet name. And I'm going to call it, it Cafeteria Adjustments. And then I'm going to click on Save. And when I do that, it's going to tell me you are creating a new budgeting sheet that's going to run in the background and may take several minutes. You may continue working in another browser while this process completes. Usually it doesn't take very long. Um, and then once it does, we'll get a little pop-up message here saying that the budgeting sheet was created successfully. So I'm going to X out of that. And now I'm going to see my cafeteria adjustments on here as well. And so now I have two type of adjustments. So all that's done at this point is created a worksheet for me that has existing data on there. And it also has another column that's empty for proposed amounts. That's what I want to enter in here now. So obviously, if they're choosing to upload an outside spreadsheet into this option, they can have the proposed amounts on that spreadsheet already, and it will load it in. If they're creating the spreadsheets within the scenario, then after they create the work, the budgeting worksheet, they need to go in and edit it. So I'm going to click on my administration adjustments because I can't remember if I put them in here or not, and I did. Um, and so it's pulling in everything that I selected. So what's nice too is that I can choose different properties or different fields on each different budgeting worksheet. So this one, I may not have the same fields that I had in that cafeteria one, which is kind of cool. You can pick and choose what works best. Um, and so in here, like I said, um, it pulls in my account codes that I filtered on and all of those properties, their um, existing amounts. But it also includes this PA. And by default, it usually puts in the next year. So by default, it would have shown PA 2021. Well, I don't want to work on 2021 amounts. I want to work on adjustments for this year. So I had to change that to PA, which stands for Proposed Amounts 2020. And so it labels it there. And then this would have been all blank. 
And so what I did is I did a calculation similar to what you can do in Excel to pull an amount from one of these other columns that I picked on the expendable amount. And I'm gonna click on this first one so you can see what I did. Up here in the corner, I'm saying take M2, take this amount, and I want you to uh, times it by 1.05. So I wanna add basically 5% onto this existing amount. So 105% basically, making it the same as last year, or, or I'm sorry, the same as the current year expendable, times 5% to give me 105%. And then I took that then and just used my mouse and just dragged it down to copy that formula for the rest of the fields. So you can see I have quite a few here. And that's all I did, I just pulled it down and then it took and basically it's 5% more than what the current expendable amount is. And that's going to be my adjustment that I'm making. So we'll try the same thing. I'm gonna cancel out of here since this one's done and I'm gonna to go to the cafeteria adjustments. Now before I do that, I just wanna talk about this regenerate sheet. And basically <clears throat> what this is doing is if you want to use a budget sheet from a prior year, um, you can use a regeneration option. Or if you want it to allow it to recalculate your figures, let's say I created this, um, I created this administrative adjustments um, sheet uh, two months ago. And since then, I've made changes to my figures and I basically want to regenerate it with the most up-to-date amounts, meaning expendable, uh, expended, and stuff like that. So I can click on this regenerate option, and that's what it's going to do. It's going to go out there, pull it back up. Um, but one thing to make, make you aware of is when you do regenerate it, and it you know, recalculates and gives you the most up-to-date figures, it's also going to remove your proposed amounts. So you're going to have to go in and calculate those again. So that's what the regenerate does. <clears throat> I'm going to go to the cafeteria adjustments. And I'm going to edit it. And so here's where I was talking the PA 2021 by default. Well, this is an adjustment that I'm going to make for 2020. So I'm going to go ahead and change that. And then I'm going to do another calculation. And I'm just kind of looking at my columns here. And I believe I want the expendable amount. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing in P2 equals K2 times 1.03. And so it just added 5% onto that. And then I can take this then and I can just drag this down. And you'll see the scroll bar over there kind of telling you, you know, where you're at. And I'll make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see what it did. So it pulled everything here and calculated it. And I'm just going to accept this. And now I just basically plugged in my adjustments for um, fiscal year 20. Now, obviously, you can go in and manually adjust. Um, you can go in, if I open it back up again, I can go in and I can remove um, accounts if I want to, um, add accounts. This is kind of like an Excel spreadsheet, basically. So you can go in and make changes. And so at this point, if these are the only two adjustments that I'm going to do um, for fiscal year 20, um, then what I can do then is go, just go ahead and I can save this. Now, before we do that, I just want to show you a couple things here. Um, I can take this spreadsheet and download it onto my PC and pull it into Excel if I want to make all my changes and do that in Excel. Um, this spreadsheet is pretty basic, and if you've got certain things that you like to do in Excel, you can absolutely download this, pull it into Excel, and then when you're ready to upload it back in, you can use this Upload and Replace and it will take you to a prompt to your browse button and you can find that spreadsheet that you made changes to in Excel and replace it and pull it in here. If there's one in here that's just totally wrong and you just wanna start over, you can go in and you can delete that. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and save this. Ah, 
Ah, this is a good thing. <laughs> I love these unexpected things, but it's a good, it's a good one because it's showing me an error and it's saying that I've got some invalid code values on line 61 of my cafeteria adjustment spreadsheet. Okay, let's go in and take a look. I'm going to go ahead and edit that and go down to line 61. Oh, it doesn't like my zeros. So I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of those. And I'm right clicking just to clear it out for good. And I'm going to go ahead and accept it. And we're going to try this again. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. Good. So that must have fixed it. It's pretty sensitive there. It doesn't like those little extras on those lines that don't have any amounts. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and X out of here. And I basically have my fiscal year 20 adjustments ready to go. Now, um, like I said, if I wanted to also prepare for next fiscal year, um, I could create a brand new spreadsheet and uh, create the budgeting worksheets or load them in from Excel and create a, a separate scenario for 2021. But I could also take my 20 budgets and if I view that again, there's a clone option here. And when I click on clone, It's probably, and I don't know how long this might take, it might take a little bit to get through this. I might just pretend like we're gonna do it uh, for time's sake and uh, maybe uh, what it does. But what it should do is go in and create a new budget scenario for 2021 is what it should do. <clears throat> and it should contain all of these different um, worksheets that I have in here. And as you can see, my general fund is probably thousands of uh, um, items on there. So let's see if it pulls it in. I tried this uh, last night. It took, it did take a little bit just to pull it up, but there's a lot of information that it's doing, but I think it saves you a lot of time versus going in and creating new spreadsheets for the new fiscal year. Does anyone have any questions at all while this is running? <clears throat> okay, okay, it did pull it up. And so, so it did all the work. So basically I could name this fiscal year 2021, it didn't take very long either. Uh, 2021 budgets, something like that. And then again, I've got all of my um, information in here. I'm just going to go ahead and open up the cafeteria just so you can see what all it did when it cloned that over. And so beautiful. It's got all of these same accounts that I filtered from my 20 budgets. And basically now it's got 2021 as my proposed amount, which is correct. And then I can go in and do another calculation or add in manually what I want my budgets to be for this fund. So that all has to be done for all of these before you want to save this and promote this into the budgeting worksheet. But it does save them a lot of time. If they want to structure this from here on, and create a scenario of knowing that these are going to be the same worksheets they use every year, then they can go ahead and clone it. Obviously, if they've made some changes, you know, some of these are pretty specific and they want to add stuff, um, they can go in and just create a new one and get rid of the old one. Mine are very generic. It's just by the fund. So cafeteria, general fund, my grants, that's basically going to be my 500 funds. Student activity, I just labeled 200s and 300s, and it just pulled those in. But if they've got specific ones down to the function and the object code, and they're wanting to add more, then they can go in and create a new uh, spreadsheet um, 
and upload that into this scenario. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and cancel out of this. And so, like I said, my adjustments have a proposed amount in the year 2020. So it's going to affect my current year and I'm in March, 2020 in my test account here. And then my uh, fiscal year 21, if I would have created that one, it would have had a proposed amount of 2021 and it would have gone in and saved my proposed amounts for the new year. Now, it's not doing anything <clears throat> until I go ahead and promote this scenario. Right now, it's just sitting here waiting for me to do something with it. So I know in my fiscal year 20 adjustments, I've got my proposed amounts in. This one's ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and promote this one. And it does give you this warning here. I talked about that earlier. Promotion will replace existing proposed amounts for the fiscal years related to this scenario. So if I've got my old budgets from the fall in my <clears throat> um, proposed amounts uh, area, it's totally going to overwrite it. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on promote. And it's gonna go out there now and it's taking everything from my 20 adjustments. So that would be my 006 and my administrative ones and promoting them to the proposed amounts area. So it says a promotion was successful. So if I go into budgeting and click on proposed amounts, now I'm going to see those accounts with those budgeted, those new budgeted amounts that I have here. So your proposed amounts is your working area. Um, so here you can go in and add accounts to your grid, you can delete. And all this is doing is just deleting the proposed amounts. It's not deleting the account. The account's still out there. You go back in and look it up in core accounts, you're still gonna see it. It's just going to um, get rid of the amount that you set up here. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick on this very first one that we see. And so this is uh, 001, 2411, 111, so a salary count. Um, and right now I've got my proposed amount at 105,000. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over into core and accounts. I just want you to see what it's going to do. <clears throat> I'm gonna go over to the expenditure tab and we're gonna take a look at this account. <clears throat> and right now it's telling me that the current <clears throat> expendable figure is 100,000. That's correct because when we were looking at the budget originally, um, that is the current expendable, but now we're increasing that by 5%. So what we're going to wanna to do and I'm gonna go ahead and view this, is we're going to want to change this expendable figure to 105. Now by doing this adjustment, now we could go in here manually and do a budget adjustment and do that, but if you're talking, you know, 50 accounts that they want to adjust, it's easier to go through uh, the budgeting and do it that way instead of doing them one at a time. And so once we get through applying those uh, proposed, those adjustments, um, then this is going to show a positive $5,000 adjustment in here and increase the expendable amount then, and it's going to be $105,000 when we're done. So I'm going to go back to periodic and into proposed amounts. Okay, and so like I said, if there's something in here where I'm like, eh, this really, you know, this one really should have been $26,25, I want to change that and the proposed amount should really be 2700. I can do that. If there's one on here that I want to delete, I can go in and say, yeah, this tuition reimbursement, I'm just going to delete that one. And if I want to add one, I can click on create and I can put in and, you know, um, click on the down arrow to find the account that I want. 
obviously the fiscal year 2020 and the amount, and it's going to save that and create that line on here. So it's not, you know, it's looking at an existing account. It's not creating a new account. You're finding the account and you're adding your new expendable figure, basically what you want it to be. And so also, um, if there are any proposed anticipated revenues, you want to check that out to make sure that it's empty. Because if you don't, what it's going to do is when you apply, it's applying both of these. It's going and looking at budgets and proposed revenues, and it's going to apply everything. So if you're not wanting to do that, you want to make sure that um, this proposed revenues is empty. If it does have information in here, that's fine. Just click on this top box that will activate the delete and it will delete whatever proposed amounts are sitting out there in the revenue grid. So at this time, just kind of scrolling down, it should all be my administrative ones, which they, oh, which they aren't. I've got some, oh, I, oh that's right. I um, also had the 006 funds on there. So. so I've got all of my administrative, all of my cafeteria ones out there. And at this point then what I can do is I can apply these. So you're not using like, you're not selecting them. This box is only for if you want to delete them. Um, I want to just go in and apply what I have. And obviously my fiscal year is 2020. Um, if I had uh, 2021, if I already did stuff for 2021, and then I went in here and then did adjustments for 2020. You might see 2021 in here as well. So you just wanna make sure that you've got 2020 listed. And I'm going to click on apply. And so this is where you get this box. And I wanna go over this with you um, thoroughly so that you understand what's going on here is that um, you've got, uh, it says here, this process will set the temporary permanent initial budgets or anticipated revenue amounts for the selected year. Well, it does when you're selecting temporary or permanents, maybe we should change that a little bit. Um, if you're doing adjustments, which is what we're doing, it's not going to um, affect initial budget amounts. It's going to affect your expendable amount by means of additions or deductions. So if the posting period associated with the date entered does not exist, it will be created automatically by this process. So this would be basically for new ones. Um, if I'm just doing my budgets for the new year, things like that, it's going to default to 7119, or if I'm in fiscal year 2021, 7120. Um, but what we're doing is we're not going to use the permanent option. If we use the permanent option, it would overwrite my initial budgets. And I don't wanna do that. I wanna make adjustments. So I'm gonna click on the adjustment option. And in here then, it's then asking me, um, do you wanna update the gap original amount estimates? So if you remember in um, the old um, APROP program, um, it automatically updated your um, gap original estimate, estimate amounts when you did um, the um, IAB mate, IAB load, stuff like that. Um, then, and when later on, like during the year, you guys made, or you know, districts would make adjustments, they could use ACMOD and do a budget modification or an appropriation modification. And it would ask them in that program, do you want to also update your GAP original estimates? And you know, if this is near the end of the year, they may not wanna do that because those weren't their original approved estimates when they did their final um, appropriations for the year, probably back in November, December. So if we don't want those estimates to match whatever the new expendable figure is going to be, we're going to leave this unchecked. Um, the effective date here, basically this is automatically going to default to the first day of the fiscal year when you're selecting temporary or permanent transaction types. In this case, we're selecting adjustment transaction types so you have the option of entering an effective date. So if I want to put in March 1st, the adjustment will not become effective 
until you are in that processing period. So I could even put April 1st in here. And when I'm looking at March right now, it's not going to show that until I make April current. Then it's going to show that adjustment. Um, we're going to leave it as April so you can see what it's going to look like. And then I'm going to go ahead and apply this and hope it doesn't take too long here. So I'm going to click on apply. And basically what it's doing now is it's going out there and taking all of these amounts and making them the new expendable figure in the current fiscal year. And so obviously like this first one, that's going to make a positive adjustment of $5,000. So it's, we're going to see an adjusted amount or basically an addition of $5,000 to that account. It will not touch their initial figures. Um, so what I like about <clears throat> this is one, it's a heck of a lot easier than a probe. <laughs> Way easier than a probe. And plus, um, they get to go in and make any adjustments they need to on this working grid. I love this grid because you can just go in here and pull whatever you want. You can also go in and you know, create a report off of you know, what your new figures are gonna be. If you wanna somehow compare that then to maybe a budgeting worksheet. Um, and I really didn't talk about the budgeting worksheets, but we do have um, some worksheets that they could use and even um, download it into Excel. And it will have the correct format. While that's running, I'm gonna show, that, show you where that's at. I'm gonna go into my other instance here. That's pretty cool um, what it's going to allow you to do. So I'm going to go into my reports here, which are already on my home screen. And if I go to the budget expense worksheet, that's one of them. And so what this does is it puts it in a whatever, whatever format you want. So if you want it in the correct format to upload it into a budgeting scenario, you can go down to format and click like Excel data. Um, and so um, Amanda's gonna go thoroughly into reports tomorrow, so I'm not gonna get too crazy in here. Um, my query options, if I just wanna pick just the cafeteria fund, and then I'm gonna go ahead and just generate this. I'm going to try that again. My Excel isn't working nicely for me right now, so I'm going to go to the PDF and generate it that way. My query option is still saved. And so this is what this budgeting expense worksheet looks like. Now look at this through like Excel and it should um, pull in everything um, through an Excel spreadsheet as well. And it will have the proper headings on there that you can just go in and add um, or the next year proposed, add your next year proposed amounts in there, um, you know, make any updates and then you can take this worksheet and plug it into and use that upload option in the budgeting scenario and pull it in. So this has, you know, this looks very similar to the old um, budget worksheets um, that we had, bud work, app work, rev work, um, that we had in classic. And so it's got, you know, the account code, it's got the appropriated plus prior care, we were the equal our expendable, um, plus our, and then also our um, expended amount, uh, percentage next year proposed, which could be a working um, column in a spreadsheet and then our prior year amounts. So it looks kind of similar to what, how I created that one spreadsheet. So they could take this then, like I said, in an Excel, pull it in, add their next proposed amounts and upload it into the budget scenario. And that's still going. I probably should have just picked a few accounts here, but that's all right. <clears throat> we'll just work off of this one until that's done.
Okay, so um, one thing I want to do. One thing I want to for you guys. I'm getting a little feedback here. <clears throat> one thing I'm going to show you guys is um, we have in our documentation. I'm going to go to our USSR documentation, our main page. And I'm going to go down to uh, appendix. Well, first I'll go to the budgeting chapter, just so you can see um, what we have in here. So we've got a section on the scenario part, and we also have a section talking about the proposed amounts part. But this budgeting scenario steps, this is something we laid out in the appendix, and we've got links here to take you to that on how to create steps for proposed amounts for the next fiscal year. And here are the steps to making adjustments, which we just covered in the current fiscal year. So if I click on this one here, it's gonna take me to what we just went over, <clears throat> creating the scenario, how to upload any outside budgets into this scenario, um, how to you know, look at them and make changes in the working proposed so amount. Cute and how to adjust them. So those are all here. And if I go back, I can do the same thing with next year proposed. We've got a step-by-step -step in here as well. So it just goes through step-by-step -step on what they need to do to get their next year proposed amount set. Okay, it tells me, I'm back at my original um, instance here, tells me that the conversion of the proposed amounts was successful. So I had, you know, hundreds of accounts here. So it, that wasn't too bad. Um, and that's another thing you can always tell your districts is that if something's running for a while, um, just open up another session and do whatever else you need to do while that's running. And so now, um, obviously my grid doesn't change at all. Still showing I'm still in that working grid. But if I go back to core now and go to that account, I should see now that it should be 105,000. And there's my expendable figure now. So if I just view this account, I should see a positive $5,000 adjustment for the fiscal year in the month. And there's my new expended amount. And it not only did it update you know, all these administrative accounts, it also updated all those cafeteria funds that I had on there. Like I said, we're going to be going through this again on our April 10th webinar. And we also, one other thing I wanted to bring to your attention, um, I'm trying to make as many connections to our documentation and our newsletters to help um, so that you can pass on this information to your districts. But in our newsletter, and it was the one from last August. Down at the bottom, we had um, instructions on how to budget for the current fiscal year. So we thought this was a good thing to add around August time, July, August time, because a lot of them did their next year proposed amounts back in March, April, you know, May. And now those are sitting in here. And if they wanted to take those and they were temporaries at that time, they could change them from temporary to permanent in here. Um, and, or, or using these steps. So it just kind of went over, you know, what they need to do to change their temporaries to permanence. And we had like, this is what it looked like before applying to permanent, and this is what it looked like after. And then if you're establishing permanence and you didn't have any temporaries from the prior year, then you can do this. And if you just want to adjust your expendable receive amounts, which is what we just did, then you would do this step. So that's another thing um, that's out there and available for them to take a look at if you want them to reference some of these um, old newsletters. Um, some of the newsletters, you know, that are quite old may have some old data and one of these days we'll get to cleaning that stuff up. But what we're also doing is, you know, reintroducing any changes. So if there have been major changes to the budgeting, obviously we would put that in the new newsletter with the new changes. So, but some of this stuff hasn't changed much, so they can reference these old newsletters. 
All right, that's basically the budgeting in a nutshell. Um, I mean, like I said, this is an overview and we are gonna be covering quite a bit of the same stuff in our April webinar, but doesn't hurt to hear it again. But do you have any questions before I move on to the periodic menu? Or anything you wanna post in chat? Okay, so what I'm gonna do, is we're gonna go ahead and just move right on. And I'm over at the periodic menu and we do have quite a bit to go through. Um, some of this stuff, I'm not gonna get real into detail because we are gonna be covering some of the fiscal year end stuff um, when we do our May webinar. Um, I'm gonna take you back while we're talking about that to, go back to the wiki here to our meetings and training page and go to all of our webinar information. And we are starting to add um, more webinars here for um, up through the uh, May. And um, we've got on May 8th, we have scheduled our classic fiscal year end review. So this will just cover classic information and then on May 14th, we've got our redesign fiscal year end checklist. So we had to move this from a Friday to a Thursday. So we just wanted to note that, that most of these, you know, all on Fridays uh, with fiscal for a reason, um, most of these are on Fridays, um, but um, some of them we had to change due to other conflicts. Um, this one on May 1st, we are gonna change that up. Um, this is incorrect right now. Um, we are going to be doing uh, kind of a import, export, or pre-import, post-import, um, um, talking about carryover encumbrances and things like that uh, on that day instead in USAS. Um, we've had a lot of questions, uh, a lot of people sending in tickets regarding carryover uh, encumbrance issues when they're trying to do test imports. And so the last time we had a webinar about this was last summer. And so we felt that we needed to do another one because we've got a lot of new, you know, ITCs coming on board and newer people at the ITC. So we thought it was a good idea to get another webinar talking about carryover encumbrances. We made some mm -hmm. updates to our carryover encumbrance page on the wiki. We just want to go through that with you guys. So we are, are going to do new contracts, but we're going to have to reassign that to another day. Um, but um, we just want to let you know too that we are going to be doing another carryover um, encumbrance uh, session as well. And that one we're, we're planning on scheduling there in the beginning of May. Okay, so let me go back. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about, um, since we were kind of talking about budgeting and all that stuff, um, we're going to talk about the uh, appropriation resolution and the certification reports. We're going to go through those first, and then I'm kind of going to jump around in this one. Also, at about 10.15, we're going to take a, a break here um, so everybody gets a chance to stretch. Um, so the appropriation resolution report, I'll go through that first. I just want to bring it up just to show you what's going on here. Um, so obviously your appropriation resolution here is the same thing as classics US, USA certs appraise APP RES report. Um, and so in here, it's basically prompting you for the same things that you saw in the old um, APP RES report in classic. Uh, the fiscal year, this does not do anything but put that fiscal year on the report. So if you're trying to click 2012 and trying to get appropriation report for 2012, it's not going to be 2012's numbers. I wish it would, but it's not. Um, it's just for the sake of placing that fiscal year on the report. Um, so obviously, if you change your posting, your current period, back to... Um, you know, June 
2019, then you would see the correct figures, but it all has to do with the uh, current period that's sitting up here. Amounts to use, those same amounts that you had in classic, beginning balance only, next year proposed, fiscal to date appropriation carryover and totals, and then the fiscal date minus the carryover encumbrances. So before, you know, running one of these reports, I just want to talk to you about some initial setup that's done underneath for accounts. There is a fund tab that has some setup for the appropriation resolution and the certification reports. So if I just click on the general fund here, you can see this. So we've got a couple things in here and I want to talk about this fund info section because that has to do with these two reports. Um, first off, by default, every fund will be included in the resolution. So it, by default, it's checkmarked. I'll go ahead and edit so you can see this better. Um, to include in the appropriation resolution. If this is unchecked, this fund would not be included. So if you uncheck this for your 200 funds, all your 200 cash accounts, none of those would be included on the appropriation resolution report. So that's one way of excluding funds that you don't want to appear in that report. Um, with this also is included on the resolution is how do you want the resolution levels? If you remember in classic, when you ran the appropriation resolution report, I think screen four contained these resolution levels because there were four screens in that report. And, um, and so how do we want this to show? Do we want to show up by just fund? Then we would uncheck the rest of these. For now, if we, by default, they're all checked. So it's going to go first by fund on the report. Then it's going to pare it down by fund special cost center. Then the first digit of the function. And then the two digits of the function and the one digit of the object code. So you're going to see quite a bit of detail on that appropriation resolution report. Um, but like I said, if you just want it to be by fund and first digit of the object code, you could uncheck these three, and that's how the general fund is going to appear. So um, any questions about the appropriation resolution part of this? The other part is the certificate reporting. So when you're doing the um, certificate or the amended certificate, how is this going to appear? Do you want it to appear and just have, maybe you have several 001 funds, maybe you have 001 all zeros, obviously, and you've got an 001 9100, 001 9200. Do you want them all lumped together? Then you would select fund. If you want them split out, then you would leave the default of fund special cost center. And so that's kind of this, uh, how that's set up initially by default. So these can be changed at any time. This just could be a one-time change, or you could also, they could also change it up at any time. And their preparation resolution sorting is going to look a little, or not the sorting, but the way the um, accounts are going to appear is going to look a little different on the report. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I've got an appropriation resolution sitting out here already just to save us time. So let me get to my downloads here. And I'm going to pick on this one and pull it up. So this is the one I ran yesterday. And so the way I selected it is, um, sorry, I skipped my reports page here. Um, I chose, and this is what's nice too, I'm liking these with this report options and most of our reports have this check mark by default. So I was missing the old options page from the classic reports. So I'm liking that we have this now. But you'll see under the query parameters, I selected fiscal year 2020. And I also said, I just wanted to see the beginning balances and include zero amounts false. That's just the default. So I just took that. Um, and so here is what the appropriation resolution looks like when you run it based off of my beginning balance um, option that I chose. 
And so because I had all of those resolution levels selected, that's exactly how this report is showing. First by fund, then fund special cost center, first digit of function, two levels of function, one level object. So again, they don't want this to appear this way and they just wanna see fund special cost center and object code, they could uncheck those resolution levels. And so maybe they want it to show this way for the general fund, but for all their other funds, they want it by, like I said, fund special cost center and object code. They can do that. So one time setup and then they're done. Okay, so that's the appropriation resolution. The other one I must jump to is the certification reports. So you've got amended certificate and the certificate, which was the old cert bell, um, on this um, screen here. And so you just go down and select the one that you want. We've got summary and detail for both. So I'm just gonna pick the default um, amended certificate. Fiscal year again, just to show on the reports. Then you got your tax options here. So um, it shows you and it tells you values included as taxes by default. So it's gonna show by default in the taxes column on the report. If you want these specific types to go into the other column on the report, you need to check mark them. So if I want specific property tax allocation, I just check those and those amounts will show on the other column on the report. Um, income tax, if you hover over, it'll tell you what it's going to pull. It's going to pull 1130s. So if you somehow have income tax set at 1120, it's not going to be able to be moved over to the other column. Um, other taxes, 1190. And so, so now you know what's going to show up in there. Um, excluding accounts, if you want to exclude accounts from this report, maybe you didn't want to exclude Exclude the account. Oh, that was for the appropriation resolution. Never mind. Um, for the amended certificate, the certificate. If you need to exclude certain accounts, you just click on this check or this plus here, and you can put in whatever you want here. So, so, and we we also have little tool tips that pop up. Say use for excluding maybe your budget reserve fund or your student activity, or your auxiliary or four hundred one funds, things like that. Also, principal amounts. Um, so this works the same way that it did um, in classic. So this amount will be subtracted. So your principal amount for those permanent funds, you would enter those principal amounts in here. And just the interest will then be included. So um, this amount it even says it, this amount will be subtracted from that July 1st cash balance column that you're going to see on the report. Same as in classic. Advances not repaid. So obviously this works the same as it did in classic as well. So any advances that haven't been repaid by July 1st should be entered in here. So, and I even think when I hover over it, it tells me what it's gonna do. There we go. So it should be a positive amount for the fund that made the advance and a negative amount for the fund that will be making the reimbursement. So again, you just use your plus sign to add those. And then we have the different formats how we want this report to show. And I believe I have an appropriation or a amended certificate. Maybe I don't. Nope, so let's generate this one. And while that's running, I just wanna show you something in the documentation I want to take you to these chapters because I want to make note of a couple things. So going under periodic and going into the certificate reports. And <clears throat> if I go to this certificate, let's go down to the amended certificate first. And first thing I want to make note of is the report column calculation. So basically here's the report that's generating right now. We've got an un unencumbered July 1st cash balance, our taxes column, our other sources, and our total. So this report column calculation is very important and one that 
we do get a lot of questions on because people think that it's received amount and not receivable amounts. This is your estimated resources. So it's your estimates, not your actuals. So in here, the unencumbered uh, balance July 1st calculated for each fund by taking that July 1st cash balance minus prior year encumbrances plus any advances not repaid that were entered in the system minus any principal amounts that were entered in <laughs> on this uh, section as well. This part here is the one that trips people up. Taxes and other sources. So your taxes and your other sources are your receivable amounts. They aren't your received. And so, and it's based off what's being pulled in um, here, uh, whether you want it to show in the taxes column or you want it to show in the other column. And then the total is columns uh, one and two and three. Now we also have narratives. If you remember in classic, we had you know, uh, an area there where um, it contained the district's name, location, signature lines for the budget commission, things like that. Um, we don't have a way to create that with the report. So we have those narratives in here. So they're in a word format here. I pull it up, this is what it looks like. So basically same type of information as what we had in the old amended certificate report. So we also, if I scroll back up to the cert bell or the certificate report, um, again, we've got our report column calculation. So they know exactly what each of those columns is doing, what they're doing. And also we have a narrative here, another Word document here that they can save and customize for their district. Okay. If I go back to my instance, my amended certificate did finish. So I can take a look at this. And it looks very similar to what we just saw in the documentation. Okay. Go ahead and X out of that. Okay, any questions about the certificate programs? Those are basically the big three under periodic, your appropriation resolution and your amended certi certificate and your certificate reports underneath the certification reports. The other thing I wanna talk about is the cash reconciliation. That's the next thing. I love the cash reconciliation. Love it, love it, love it. I did not like um, classics cash rec. I was, I always struggled with that. And if I made a mistake and having to go in and make changes, this is so much better. Um, and so what I'm gonna show you is the one that was created for February. So obviously if you wanna create a new one, you can click on create, but I wanna show you something even better. When I view February's, it's gonna pull up everything from February and I can use clone to make marches, which is wonderful when you've got a bunch of investment information in there, <clears throat> all of your bank information in here, all your petty cash, all of that. It's basically going to pull all this stuff over and then you can just make changes to it. It's awesome. Um, and also um, a lot of people wanted an actual PDF file to print and sign. So if I pull this up and display it for you. It's got everything from my January, or sorry, from my February cash rec and a place for treasurer signature. So um, going back to this. So in here, I'm going to go ahead and um, clone this <coughs> and clone it for March. This to be March. And you'll notice then is it brought everything over that I had before. And then I would just go in and make my, uh, obviously, the amounts for the end of March. So, um, so just to go over this a little bit here, we've got our gross depository balances. So what I would do is go underneath here, underneath description, and add my description and my amount. 
and click on add and it's going to add it to that section and it's also going to update my total over here um, cash and transit to the bank has to be entered manually outstanding checks has to be entered manually um, adjustments it can be done the same way so by going down here adding the adjustment in the amount and it will be pulled in here so calculates the total adjustments and then the total adjustments to the bank and then treasury bonds notes and cds enter that stuff in here other investments so if i've got some um, when i clone it pulls them right over make any adjustments add any additional ones i need to to it to total up my other investments so the total investments then would be all of this information petty cash change cash all of that can be entered in here and then basically um, total entered balance is all the information that I entered on this screen total fund balance is coming from the cash balance amount currently so obviously those two should match um, it will save the report and I think it does produce a warning that they aren't matching but it will still save the report and then I also have it down here I can also put in here uh, my uh, depository depository clearance account information as well just as an FYI so I'm going to go ahead and go back to February's here so you can see that those things did balance here's my entered amount and here's my cash fund balance so obviously if I made February current, I don't have to open it, but if I make February current, it should reflect February's amounts in this total fund balance. So, and what's even better is, you know, they start doing a collection here of their cash rec for those months, they can always go to the grid and view a cash rec from a prior month. So they're all here. So I'm really, liking this so much better than uh, what we had in classic there's really not a whole lot to it i know we've had some reports of performance with the cash rec and obviously that's something that we are aware of um, to improve that we have made improvements to it it used to be definitely slower trying to get in and out of it and you can see when i got into it it didn't take time at all so um so those are um, things that we're still aware of and we're working on All right, um, I'm gonna move on to the five-year forecast, then after that we'll take a break. It probably won't take long to go through the five-year forecast because that's very easy as well. So with the five-year forecast, um, we do have some reports and we also that we could run, and we also have the actual forecast option underneath periodic um, to actually create um, a spreadsheet or to load it automatically pull it in to SSDT's forecast. I'm going to click on this. And so with the five-year forecast, we're going to have two options. We're going to have a CSV option and we're going to have an Excel option. Now the CSV option will create a spreadsheet that then they could take and pull it into whatever third-party software they're using. Um, and so basically that's what that will do. The Excel option is going to actually pull it into SSDT's forecast page. So we've had the forecast, a working forecast SSDT for years, um, but this makes an automatic connection to that forecast. It's real sweet how it does it. Um, but you'll see here what's on here. It shows us um, the line numbers and the account codes that are included that makes up those figures. And it's going to give us the prior three years, the average percentage of change in our current year figures. Um, so it's going to pull in obviously revenue in the first half and then um, expenditures in the second half of the grid. I know we've had requests to put in a filter row in here, so I believe we have a feedback issue for that. 
to include that. I mean, this same type of setup can be done on the budget, on the expenditure grid um, for now, but um, I know that's something that they're looking into. So the Excel option I was talking about, if I go ahead and click on this and click on generate, I didn't test this out. I'm working off my laptop instead of my uh, VM. So hopefully I've got everything I need here on my laptop and it's starting that. So while that's running, I'm gonna show you in the documentation. Here underneath, I'm just gonna to go to reports chapter here, report manager. And so we do have a financial forecast or financial report by forecast line number. That's one of the reports that we have. Um, and so this is going to contain, so it looks very similar to the grid. It's going to contain your forecast line numbers, the totals, um, and your prior year. So this can be run ahead of time. Um, if you know, wanted to take a look at it or if you wanted to pull it in, I believe you can use any type of format. So this is similar to our USAS FF report in Classic. <clears throat> And I think that's the only other one. I'm gonna to jump to my other one while that's running, see if we've got anything else. What I usually do is I'll go to the report manager and, and these are you know, obviously things that Amanda's gonna show you tomorrow that I can filter on forecast just to see what do we have that is related to it and it's just that one. So and that's what I just showed you in the documentation. So if I go back, I do have <coughs> a spreadsheet here. Unfortunately, because I'm not on my VM, I don't have um, my Excel is not working for some reason. Um, so unfortunately, I can't pull it up. But what would happen, I want to take you to that website here. I'll go to... I am getting a little bit of feedback. Go to this. And what it really would have done is it would have taken that spreadsheet. This probably isn't going to work either. Darn it. And it would pull it into my five year forecast spreadsheet. Um, and from there, it would allow me to go in and basically <laughs> plugs in all the information already. It plugs in all the information already that I can just go in and put in the year. And um, it allows me then just to generate my spreadsheet right from here. Um, these five-year forecast spreadsheets have been around for a long time. So we've got different ones, standard, standard with locks and basic. So, but it's basically got, you know, the standard format that they would need for their forecast, but then that they could go in and upload into EMIS FFE. Um, Get the information they need um, from there um, and then you know uh, send that to OEE. So um, so yeah so everything is there in the forecast just unfortunately my laptop doesn't have these resources so I apologize. Um, I wasn't sure if my VM was going to be working um, good today so I wanted to make sure that I was on my laptop when I did all this stuff so um, so I apologize that I can't show that to you. And that's something too, like I said, in, you know, when you guys get the evaluation from us, um, there is a comment section in the evaluation that you can, that's asking you what type of training sessions you'd like us to do, like for our Friday webinars. So if it's something where you'd like to go over the forecast in a little more detail, we can do a specific um, webinar just for the forecast information. And if you want us to go all the way through, you know, the steps, and you know, sending it to ODE and stuff like that, um, 
running through EMIS FFV, we can do that. Okay, any questions about the forecast? There really isn't much to it in the redesign, so. All right, let's take a break. And then what we'll do is um, we'll come back in about uh, five, five or so minutes. How about uh, 1025? We'll come back and um, we'll start on the spending plan. We'll talk about that. And then we'll move on to the fiscal year end and calendar year end steps of periodic and go from there. I'm just gonna go ahead and pause the recording and we'll see you guys back here at 1025. All right, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get started. Again, if everybody had a chance to stretch. Um, what we're gonna talk about next is, we're about halfway through the periodic, um, but we're going to uh, talk about the spending plan. And um, what the spending plan is, it's the uh, Classics SM1 uh, information, the SM1 maint allowed them to go in and enter <coughs> their um, estimates um, on their spending plan. So this is basically kind of a workhorse um, for tracking your budgets versus your actuals when it comes to your revenue and expenditures in the current year. So I don't know how many uh, districts used the SM1 mate in uh, classic, I know some used it faithfully because it is a good measure to see where you are in your estimates versus what you've actually spent for those uh, funds that are involved in the SM2. Um, so in here, it's very straightforward in how this works. I have not created a spending plan, um, but I'm just gonna show you a simple, um, all it does basically is it, it defaults to the current year and then in here, you're selecting what forecast line number that you're um, talking about. So I'm just going to pick on the first one here. And then you're putting in your estimates that you have. So property taxes, you know, that stuff comes in. Maybe that comes in in July and August. And then again in December and January or, or February. Um, then you can plug in those amounts. Um, and then just tab down to where else they're going to go. And then you just click on save. What's nice is if, you know, you're going in here and entering all of your estimates, you could click on create new and then click on save. And what it's going to do, it's going to leave the window open. And I'm sure that um, you know, Amanda showed you guys this stuff yesterday too, that you can do this in transaction programs as well. Um, and then you can just go right down to your next uh, line number and enter the estimates there. And then as you're enter entering them in, just gonna cancel out of here, it's going to display them on the grid. And then those are your estimates for fiscal year 2020. So when you're in 2021, you're entering in your SM, you know, SM1 maintenance um, amounts in there, you can do start filtering then and just look at 2021s and so on and so forth. So uh, that's really all there is with the spending plan. Uh, when it comes to entering in, uh, them in, we do have spending plan reports. So I'm gonna go to our report manager. So uh, one question that people have regarding the spending plan is, do, if I do have SM1 figures in Classic, do they get imported over? And they do not. So they will have to enter those in. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that they're uh, planning on changing. I, I don't know, but um, for now, they would have to pull those figures in, or I'm sorry, they will have to enter those figures into the redesign. So if I just do a search on, I do search for filter on spending, 
it's going to bring up, yep, the three spending reports. So this first one, the spending plan comparison, that's basically the equivalent of the SM2 uh, CMP report that was in that SM12 uh, options in Classic. And so this is a comparison and it's um, allowing you, if I go ahead and generate this quick, it's going to prompt them for the fiscal year. And then basically um, what it's going to do then is it's going to compare their actuals to their estimated figures and it's going to list it out month by month, very similar to the SM2 comp reporting classic. So they'll get to see what their actuals are, what their estimates, and then a comparison line will be displayed. Um, so real easy report, but they do need, you'll, note, you'll notice there in any fiscal year, it does say required. So they do need to put in the fiscal year um, if it isn't already defaulted in there. So the SM2 uh, monthly one, SM2, or I'm sorry, I keep calling it SM2, the spending plan monthly. Um, also, they have to enter in a year for this as well. And this is going to display their monthly actual reports for each line number. So this is basically the SM2 MON report in Classic is what this is. And then the spending plan summary. This is the SM2M report in Classic. And they want to enter in the big difference between this one and this um, monthly one is the summary one will also allow them to go down to the query to put in a beginning and ending month. And it's going to display the current periods, uh, select whatever they selected there, um, their total actual amounts for each line number. And also it's going to include the estimates in actuals as well. Um, so uh, that's basically what that um, spending plan summary does. So if you know you get questions from your district saying, you know, I put in my SM one figures underneath the spending plan and I want to run some reports and look at those compare them to my actuals which are calculated on the fly these are the reports some of these reports have the actual um, estimates on there and then some of them just have the actual amounts that's really it when it comes to uh, classics sm12 features um, any questions on the spending plan? Okay, if not, I just want to move on and show you um, just quickly some of the fiscal year end options that are on periodic because we will be covering these in detail when we have our fiscal year end webinar in May. Um, but just to show you where they're at, because some of you might be just brand new to this and not even know where they're located. Again, they're all under periodic and our fiscal year ones um, are building profile information, civil proceedings, federal assistance detailed summary. Those are the ones that have to do with fiscal year end. So these, so right now in classic, the building profile is your USA EMS DB. It's the build mate option in Classic. And so those do not get, I don't believe those get imported over. So they will have to re-enter that information in the redesign. Um, USA EMS DB also had a district maintenance, which had like the central office square footage and things like that. That is already located in core underneath organization. If I go there, central office square footage and the ITC IRN, that's the other one. Those are basically your dist district maintenance stuff from Classics USA EMS DB. So those are located in here. Um, and so I don't believe those get imported in either. So that's something to check to make sure before the fiscal year end that those are filled in. Um, and then, like I said, the district stuff, I go to building profiles here and do a create. It's basically the same information you got from the building maintenance, IRN description, square footage, and your transportation and lunchrooms um, percentages. So those are entered in here. And once they're in here, they're in here forever. So obviously, if something changes next year, um, you just go in and once you add one, 
I'll just go ahead and create one quick. Small school. <laughs> um, and say if it pulls it in right here and then so next year comes around all you have to do is go in and edit this and update any changes so that's what's nice you enter in here once it's good and then you just make changes because it isn't based on you know you won't have different ones for different years you're just updating um, it every year also Go down to civil proceedings. So in classic, you had the USA EMS EDT programs, which contained your cash rec, which we already covered, your civil proceedings and your federal assistance detailed summary. So here's the civil proceedings. Again, this won't get imported in. So these need to be created. And it works the same way as our other one that we were just in. You enter it in once and then you make any updates that you need to. So I'll just show you what the create screen looks like. So you're putting in basically the same information that classic prompted you for. And federal assistance detail and summary. Um, one thing to keep note with this, I believe, and I still think it works this way, is that the summary information needs to be entered in first before the detail. And so, um, very simple fiscal year. Um, and this one here is showing if um, check if you have seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars or more in federal expenditures for this period. So if you do, you want to check mark the assistance over threshold comment if you want to, and it saves it. And then your detail. is you know asking for the CF, CFDA number, you know your line number, um, your title of your grant, uh, the cash account. So from there you can you know pull the account. I think if you start typing it in, yeah, it starts to filter. Um, federal contributions received. So you're plugging in these figures, what was receded in and what was expended from that um, grant account. And so again, this is not going to get imported over, so these need to be um, entered in. Like I said, it's a one-time thing then, and then you just make up dates. If you need to delete some off of there, if those grants are already closed out, or if you need to create new ones for new fiscal year grants. <clears throat> what happens then is um, there is a USA EMS extract, which we'll talk about, or I'm sorry, an EMS extract, talking classic terms here, um, an EMIS extract underneath the extract option that will then extract all the things that we just went over. So it'll extract the federal assistance detail summary, um, the building profile information, civil proceedings, all into basically the flat file format to get uploaded into the data collector. And we'll talk about that extract here in a little bit. One other question that we are probably going to get here is, um, you know, I've got, you know, thinking about fiscal year end is we are going to be doing a fiscal year end bundle. We've got our monthly CD bundles, we have our um, calendar year end bundles, and we also are going to have a fiscal year end bundle available before the end of the fiscal year. And it will have these reports um, with this information on it. Like I said, you know, we will be going over these options in more detail at our fiscal year end redesign seminar, which again is on May 14th when we're going to have that one. Calendar year end, we have the 1099 extract and some reports that we have out there as well. So this is something not too long ago that um, districts were doing. And so this is basically allowing the user to extract their 1099 data for a specific period. So you have options to generate the tape file and the XML file, which can get pulled into um, Edge's 
accountability software. So they were able to use that successfully. And we also have a, so depending on what you select up here, it's when you click on generate extract file, it's gonna generate that one. So obviously you're gonna have to run it twice. So if you're wanting to do the XML first, click generate extract file to create the XML file, and then you'd run it again, selecting the tape file to get the actual tape file, which then can be appended and loaded into the fire system on the IRS's website. The print report is just going to create a report of your 1099. So that's comparable to the classics F1099 report. So we do have other options available underneath the report manager, or if you go to the home screen, you'll do the same thing. And um, we have our 1099 uh, vendor report here, which produces a report of your 1099 vendors. Um, so that's another thing that can be run and checked ahead of time um, to make sure that everyone that's supposed to be getting a 10, 1099 does. So um, again, this is all part of our calendar year end. So for those of you that were not on our calendar year end webinar last year, we try to do those mid-November so that you guys get the necessary information you need before you have your calendar year end meetings with your districts. Um, so we will be covering this 1099 information in more detail then. Also, just going back to our newsletter. Go back to that. We did have um, at the end of December. Um, some information about W-2 reporting and also um, how they would go about doing their 1099s. And so it kind of just gave a brief, brief synopsis of what the districts would be doing to generate their 1099s. So we will probably be doing something like that again at the end of this calendar year, um, in case we do have some updates and stuff like that, just so districts are aware that they can do it in the redesign and here's how. Okay, any questions? So I think that's it for the periodic menu. All right, we'll go ahead and we'll move on to the extracts here. Um, Amanda's gonna cover reports tomorrow because we know that's gonna take quite a bit of time. Um, probably most of the time will be devoted to reports and report bundles and all of that good stuff. So we'll get through all that tomorrow morning. I'm going to blow past that and go right to our extract options. And we have four of them out here. Now we do have some miscellaneous extracts. Um, you know, like some of the periodic stuff was kind of an extract like the 1099 um, information. Um, Underneath our report manager, we have some extracts in there as well, like the inventory extract. Um, but um, the majority of them are found here underneath the extracts menu. So this first one is our EMIS extract, and this is going to extract the financial data into EMIS R. This is what I was just talking about. Um, is that it takes the information, the financial information from the periodic menu and pulls it into uh, a file then, that then can be loaded into the data collector. And this is basically your flat file, um, that your partial file that was generating classics USA EMS. So it used to be called, um, or it is called because people are still using classic, uh, the USA EMS underscore EMS R dot SEQ file. So basically that equivalates to this option in redesign. Um, and so you're basically going to create this, like I said, import it into the data collector and use that along with the USAS SIF agent to collect your financial data for the period H reporting period. Now, one thing I have heard and I've seen in ODE's EMIS notes is that they are not going to be requiring capital asset information this year. Yay. So um, they use, a lot of people um, would wait 
and do their inventory in the supplemental period. Um, but there are some that did it um, during the period H um, period as well. But um, we're still getting more information about that, um, but they do have it on their EMIS call conference notes, and there are a couple sections in there that discusses that and states that they are not going to be requiring it, but they're going to provide more information here within the next month or, or so. So definitely by May, when we do our um, fiscal year end webinars, we can give you more information about that. Um, with the EMIS extract too, like I said, this creates a sequential file, but your EMIS SOAP service configuration must be updated as well to reflect the correct fiscal year. So before you run this, um, if you go to system and configuration, there is an EMIS SOAP service configuration. And in there, it should be 2020. So that should be entered in first before you run the EMIS extract um, so that that year can be placed on that sequential file and it can up, get upload okay. Um, I have a feeling if it's not in there or obviously it's still reflecting 19, you're going to get an error when trying to run a collection in the data collector. So just wanna make sure that that's updated. And again, this will be in our fiscal year end checklist um, to remind you to, or the district. Um, a lot of your district people may not have access to this, depending on what type of access they have to the system menu. So this might be something that the ITC is going in and making sure is done. Um, but the whole SOAP service configuration, um, we have that available out there um, on how to make sure that the SOAP service is connected. There are instructions out there on the wiki that is something we will definitely discuss in May as well. Um, but just to kind of show you where that's at, let me see if I can pull that. Uh -huh. Let me pull this in here. This is in our technical documentation, and it's called Configuring SOAP Service with um, Redesign. And so this is the stuff that needs to be set up in order um, for it to work properly when it rolls into the data collector. So um, these steps are provided in here. I'm not gonna get into this today, um, but this is stuff that we will talk about during our fiscal year end just being able to set up this EMIS SIF agent if it isn't already. If you've got districts that already submitted in it last fiscal year, then that stuff for that, that district's already done. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, but any new districts that weren't on last year at fiscal year end, um, this type of stuff needs to be um, entered in. And one other thing that needs to be done in redesign in the instance is there needs to be a username created um, with the EMIS SIF role. So if I go down to users here, because that user is going to talk to um, the SOAP service. So it would have to be, we'll click on create, and we have an actual EMIS SIF assigned role. So you could call this EMIS R or whatever you want. But as long as that role is assigned to it, then when you're doing that SOAP service configuration, it's asking for that username. And so you're going to supply that name in here, right here. Um, and that's going to help with the SOAP connection. That's going to make that SOAP connection between that and the SIF agent. But like I said, we'll get into more of that at fiscal year end, but um, that's kind of the setup that you know needs to be done in order for it to work properly with the SIF agent and the data collector. Okay. Uh, the gap option um, is just your um, gap exp file that you used to have in classic. So in classic um, USA exp, there was a gap exp option where they plug in um, the fiscal year 
um, and enter that and submit that. And so that file, then you have to go in and pull in correct year and click on submit and it'll generate the file. And if you need to then send this on to um, an accountant or an auditor, you would just email this file to them. In Classic, we used to have a line there it would automatically submit it, or you have to enter in an email address and it would send it to them. Well, here um, you have to go in and then once this is um, created, you would just go email that person and attach it to the email and then they can go in and upload it into WebGap. So real simple. Add a whole lot to it. Your online checkbook. Um, Ohio has a checkbook system out there and what districts can do in Classic and Redesign. Classic has the checkbook program and we have the online checkbook extract and redesign that will allow you to put in beginning and ending dates, exclude any accounts that you don't want to show on there and generate a file then that can be um, sent to um, the uh, online checkbook program. Now there are a couple changes that are taking place with this. Um, I know that um, with the redesign, you have to, after this gets generated, you have to have a login to OpenGov, which is the FTP site. Um, that actually file transfers this file that's generated to the checkbook system. Um, and I know that it is working because I've been getting emails back from the state treasurer's office with a list of districts. Um, she, um, Lauren from there, um, she has been sending me <clears throat> every so often, I've asked her, could you just send me a list of what you've received lately of districts, whether they're classic or redesign, just so I know the redesign ones are coming through okay, and they are. Um, we had a couple hiccups with a couple um, redesign districts, and I think the issue was is that the item descriptions, if they're very, very long, um, they were having problems with the transfer. And so through OpenGov, they would send the file that gets, the extract file that gets created here onto the state treasurer's office via email and the state treasurer's office was loading it in. But we have some redesign districts that don't have any issues at all. So there is going to be a change taking place. The OpenGov site that does the FTPing, um, they're no longer going to use them. Um, Ohio's online checkbook is going to be doing it themselves. They're going to be handling the FTP. So we're in the process of talking with them right now and making sure that these get sent to them, whether classic or redesigned successfully during this transition. So we're hoping to have this um, FTP transition done before the end of the fiscal year. Um, but for now, you know, Redesign districts are going to continue doing it the way they've done. Go ahead and generate this. And then they already have a login to OpenGov. They would log in there, pull this in there, and then OpenGov sends it on to um, the Ohio Online Checkbook System. I don't know how many of your districts are using this online checkbook extract, but if they were using it in Classic, and they're wanting to use it in the redesign, this is where they need to go. And we have this documented too, uh, with this information in the checkbook um, section of the extract chapter. Any questions about the checkbook? You guys are a quiet bunch today, just kind of soaking it all in, huh? Uh, the last one, positive pay. So districts are using positive pay in classic using Autorex extract option. They have the same capabilities in here. Now, obviously in classic, that's set up in an INI file. Those don't get imported into the redesign. So it has to be set up in redesign as well, whether it's um, reconciling, you know, doing the auto reconciling or the positive pay, doing the auto extract 
Um, the auto reconciling, um, Amanda went uh, with you guys yesterday when she went through disbursements. Um, but if you're wanting to set up positive pay, it's in the extract, it's not in the disbursement grid. So this is basically what it is. So you can either set up a CSV or a fixed format, depending on what the bank needs. And then from here, it's sele you're selecting the fields that you want to extract on. So bank account number, or if I just want the check number, and then I'm going to add a plus sign to add another one, and I want the check date, and then I want the amount, and I can either have um, amount without a decimal or amount with a decimal, depending on the bank's format. And then basically, the length and the formats are already predefined. These can be changed. Um, I don't have a whole lot of documentation yet about that. If that's stuff that you guys are needing and you need to change the format or the length, um, create a ticket and we can walk through you because I'm going to have to grab one of our developers to help me with it. Um, but uh, that is something, you know, we're hoping we haven't really had any questions about this part of it. Um, so we, we're hoping to add some more documentation to that in the future. So I'm putting in my starting date. So this is pulling my checks from that date, my disbursements. Um, and then my whatever my bank account is and then it will go ahead and it will generate either a CSV file or, or a fixed file format sequential file format um, and then from there I can transfer that to the bank and then they can load it in for positive pay so once this is done you know once I you know I'm out of here it'll save what I've set up here and then I would just go in change whatever date I need to and generate a new one I know we've had requests from people asking for um, some type of text file or something because I know that we've got that option in the auto rec um, program underneath disbursement. So those are feedback issues that we've created and hoping to get to those some, someday and be able to do that. You guys have any questions about positive pay? All right, well, so far we've covered budgeting, we've covered our periodics, and we've covered our extracts. Um, the next thing that we're gonna go into, and it's probably gonna take me a little while, is to get through some of the system information. And this is more, you know, definitely a benefit for you guys than it is for um, a lot of these, an ITC per, or a district person may not have access to, it just depends. And it depends on how the ITC um, has things set up with the district. But um, I know that some of you have questions about looking up things, especially after imports. And is there something I can see underneath maybe monitor to check things out? So we are gonna go into monitor. Um, and go into those options that are gonna benefit you guys. Now, we did discuss this with the developers not too long ago, just to say, hey, you know, out of these things underneath monitor, what is beneficial for the ITC staffers to know? Uh, because we're learning too. We're learning as we go. Um, they, you know, they haven't uh, sat down and, and done a, a major training with us either on the monitor, because a lot of it is stuff that we really don't need to know, but I'm going to show you some of the things that I'm hoping will benefit you guys, um, especially when it comes to your imports. Um, but before we get to monitor, we're gonna start from the top here and we're gonna cover um, uh, every single one of these um, and go through what, you know, what's in here. So under configuration, um, this is going to basically contain details for installing modules or, um, or the modules that have already been installed. So, go through here. So, with um, the import, some of these things are already taken care of. So your payable module, and you can just click on these. You don't have to click on edit unless you're gonna go in and make a change. But if you click on this, it'll give you a little sidebar just to tell you 
uh, what's, what's the um, status of each of these. And so the payable module is basically saying that this is initialized. And you have several that are initialized after import. So the payable, um, the classic migration. And so what this is doing is recording um, the import year and the last time that adjust was run for fiscal year end. So it's gonna pull that information from classic. Um, the encumbrance module should be initialized upon import, expenditure, the GL journal entry. So those all should be marked as initialized and the revenue modules. So um, those are initialized upon import. So some of these others in here can be set up after import. And I'm gonna go to our post import procedure so you can see that we've got this labeled in here go back to the wiki and I'm going to go down to USAS R and this is all underneath our appendix and this is our how we've um, segmented the appendix chapters and underneath migration procedures our post import we have some of these set up here just to let you know that underneath configuration these are options that can be done after import. Um, you go to the classic migration configuration. Like I said, it already pulls that stuff in, but you just want to verify that that information is there, which we already did. Um, EIS classic configuration. So if your district is currently using classics EIS system in here, um, you want to look at the pending threshold amount and the automatic checkback check box value and make sure that those are set up correctly compared to what they had in classic. Um, I'm going to talk about the, e the EIS extract information tomorrow at the end of the day, so I'll go into this one in more detail tomorrow. Um, the EMA soap service, we talked about this a little bit ago. So this is where they're going in and entering the fiscal year that the district will be reporting for the next period age. So if you have a district importing now, you want to make sure that the EMA soap service is entered 2020 in there before you run the EMAS extract. And then the transaction configuration is where you can specify the highest transaction number. Um, so this is similar to in USA Con, how we had the highest numbers listed on that first screen in there. So I want to get into that one in a little more detail. So I'm going to go back to my instance here and let's talk about that one. So I'm going to go ahead and edit that. Right now these all default to all nines. Okay and so if you have got, um, I know we've received tickets about vendor numbers and receipt numbers where what's happening is they have vendor numbers that were memo vendors and classic that, that were you know started with a 900,000 number um, those are um, considered electronic checks now in the redesign when they get, or electronic vendors, I'm sorry, when they get imported into the redesign, but there is no 900,000 number that designates a memo vendor in, in redesign anymore. It's the type, the check type. When you create a vendor, and Amanda showed you that yesterday, you had electronic or check. So those memo vendors are now you know, labeled as electronic depending on that type. and It doesn't care what the vendor number is. So what districts are running into is they're going in and they've got a maybe their highest vendor, memo vendor number in classic was 900,001. And their last regular vendor number in classic was 5,000. Well, what's happening is when they go in to create a new vendor, and they save that vendor, it's assigning 900,002. They don't want that. They want it to be 5,001. So they're like, how do I change that to reflect that correct number? They want to go into the transaction configuration. And if they don't have any other vendor numbers between 5,000 and 900,001, that are currently on the system, they are going to make 
900,001 as their highest vendor. What happens then is when they go in to create a vendor and click on save, it's going to look and say, oh, 900,001 is the highest vendor. What was the last vendor issued? Oh, it was 5,000. So we're going to make 5,001. We're going to assign that number to this vendor. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> so same thing with receipts. Um, we're noticing like a big gap in receipts. So they go in and if, you know, you just have to go into the receipt grid and look at their receipts and they may have receipt 5,000 and then they have another huge gap until receipt number 7,000. And what's happening is right now, if I leave the receipt number as is, it's going out there and setting um, the next receipt number of 7,001 where they really want it to be 5,001. So all they have to do is change this to the 7,000 number. And what happens then is it, you know, looks at that gap between 5,000 and 7,000, sees that 7,000 is the highest number and reverts back and says, oh, the last receipt number used was 5,000, I'm gonna make it 5,001 when it assigns the receipt number. So that's one thing you just kind of have to look at. What are the gaps? You know, when the stuff gets imported in um, and they're having trouble with, you know, how the receipt or how the transaction numbers are being assigned, you want to look at their grids, like the receipt grid, the PO grid, whatever, and see if there's a huge gap and then make the highest number the beginning of that, you know, you know, after that gap, the beginning number of the gap. So like I said, 5,000, 7,000, make 7,000 the highest receipt number so it knows to bounce back to those 5,000 numbers and assign the next available number. Hopefully that made sense, but that's, that's when we get a lot of questions on or transaction configuration. How do I set that up? And we do have it documented with an example in, um, in the chapter. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Um, the USPS configuration, um, that's what's being basically set up um, to make sure that USAS and payroll are talking to one another. Um, we do have, I believe, under modules, the USPS integration module. So this is what, and this is one of our post import steps, is to make sure that this has been installed. And once this has been installed, and we'll get into modules here in a little bit, then underneath configuration, and when you look at that, you'll see all of this wonderful API um, information. And you can see from here that, you know, we're in USAS. This is the API key. Here is the remote application ID, which is the payrolls side and the API key for that. And this is how it's talking to payroll, basically. So when they go in and post to payroll um, or go in and post a board uh, distribution, um, you know, the board disk, board ret um, information, it's then talking to USAS and placing those files underneath the pending transaction. I'm sure, I mean, I probably talked about this yesterday. Um, but if those two aren't set up to talk to one another, we can't get that information posted from payroll into USAS and vice versa. Same thing with vendors and accounts. They're trying to pull stuff in payroll. It's looking at USAS for that information. So this is a requirement. This has to be set up um, before they start running, you know, um, their systems. And again, that's part of our post import to make sure that that information is set up. So this part right here, USPS integration module. So when we get into modules here in a little bit, we'll talk about that. Okay, any other questions about the configuration? We do have this all documented. Um, on our wiki, we keep building on these um, system manager 
as, as much as we can, we need to bug the developers <laughs> for the information. Um, but, um, you know, they don't want to get too technical and I don't want them to, you know, if it's st stuff that isn't going to help us. Um, but we also want to give as much information as we can too, so that you guys feel comfortable going in and making updates to these. And so here is our configuration. And we do try to, down here, we do have like what each one is. And we do tell you if it's something that is initialized upon import. And so we try to explain all of this information in here. So we do have some um, pretty good upda updated documentation on the configuration menu. Okay, I'll move on. I don't see any chat messages here. So I'll get, go ahead and I'll move on here to the next option. And that's the custom fields. And I know a lot of you, you know, everyone's still kind of, you know, getting used to just the system and stuff like that. But you may have some districts that have been on the redesign for at least six months, if not a year already. And um, this is something to show them after they get pretty comfortable that they can go in and create custom fields in any of the uh, uh, user interfaces. So if I wanted to create a custom field in the receipt interface, I can. If I want to create a custom field in the vendor inter interface to track something, I can do that. And so this is going to show you all of the ones that are set up by default. So when I go into, I'm going to pick on vendors. I'm going to go in the vendor window. And there's already like custom fields or what we call them in classic user defined fields. So I'm just going to pull one of these up here. And we have a section here called standard custom fields. And so all of these are already in this grid. So um, if there are certain ones in here that you want to rename, you can do that. Code one doesn't tell me much. But if I want to track something and I want to use this, I can go into the custom fields and change the name of that to whatever I want and use that field. Um, if I want to take a field or create a field and put it in one of these other areas, for example, the 1099 section, if I want to track W9 information, I can do that. I can go in here and place that in here. To me, it does take a little testing to kind of place it in the right spot. But I want to show you an example of this and I'm going to create a custom field for this section so you can see what it's doing. And I want to pay attention to the section name. I've got an amount, got a 1099, a new hire, you know, so I want to make sure that I've got that 1099 in my head when I'm creating this custom field because I want to put it in this section. And then what order I put it in I have to kind of play around with that. You may try it, open up this window, say, oh, I don't like it there, I wanna place it in front of ignore limits. Well, then you can go in and modify that custom field and change the sort order. So let's talk about that. So if I go back into custom fields, and I'm gonna just go down to um, the vendor. And so these are all the custom fields that are already out there um, that are on the vendor user interface. So again, like I said, that code one, I could go in here and edit this and change it to um, code or something like that and click on save. And so now when I look at it in the custom field section on the uh, in, yeah, the custom field section, um, it'll say vendor code instead of code. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to add one. So I'm going to click create. And what type? So these are all defined in our documentation. A Boolean is like true or false, basically. Um, and so you can check it um, or uncheck it. I'm going to use that for mine. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm 
kind of create a custom field saying, did we, do we have a W9 on file? Um, and if it's checked, it means that we do. So I'm gonna check Boolean. And so there are other ones. There's a code option here where you can build your own dropdown. So if there are certain things that uh, maybe for receipts or something like that, you wanna label what type of receipt it was, um, you can create a code for that and student activity or whatever, um, put that stuff in there or maybe you know, different kinds of um, third party vendor, like you know, pay school or something like that and put that stuff in there um, and create a drop down to select what type of receipt um, came in. Um, so there's lots of different formats here, date, time, um, all kinds of stuff. So, um, so I'm gonna go ahead, like I said, and select Boolean. And then what record, what um, transaction or um, UI user interface are you trying to add this to? And I want this added to vendor. And then after I select my type of custom field and where I want it to show up, I click on continue. And now it's asking me for the display name. Display name. So W9. And then the order. So where in that 1099 section do I want that to go? I want it to be right at the beginning. So I'm just going to leave the order zero. If I put in like maybe a five or a six, it may go to the end um, of that section off to the right. Um, but I'm just going to go and go ahead and just leave it as zero. Um, obviously, it's active. The property name, this is the property field name. So if I wanted to pull this um, into a report, what do I want it to show as? I could say W9 again. Um, I could say W9 received, whatever. And that's what's going to appear as a property when I create a report. The group is what area of that vendor screen? I want it on the 1099 section. So I'm gonna type in 1099 and I'm gonna click on save. And so it has it out there now, here's my W9. And if I go back to core and into vendors and just view one of these, huh, I put in zero and it took it to the back. So I don't like it there. So I'm gonna change it. This is where, like I said, you're gonna find yourself doing some testing here to see where exactly did those go. So I'm gonna go back and pick on, and I'm just gonna type in W9 up here. And edit this and change it to one. And then go back to vendors. Hopefully, it's at the beginning of that 1099 section. Here we go. So that's something that as I create new vendors and we have the W9 on file, I can check mark this if I wanted to create another custom field for the date that we received the 1090 or the W9. I could put that in here as well. Um, so I have two things to check. So this is just a real simple short way to create custom fields. So when you're first getting a district <laughs> on um, the redesign, you know, that's something that, you know, you could mention that we've got these things to, to, um, to do to add custom fields. But if they're kind of looking at you like, yeah, let's talk about that later, that's fine. It's something you can introduce later when they're getting comfortable with the system. But they may already be thinking about that and say, I so wish we had this in classic. Is there any way we could track this in the redesign? Absolutely, we can create a custom field for you. So something to mention, but not something that you probably wanna mess with a whole lot when they first get started. It just, it just depends, depends on the treasurer, the district. Any questions about custom fields? Okay. I'll go ahead and move on to, we're not going to go over a database. That's nothing that you guys have to worry about at this point. So we're going to totally skip over that. We're going to hit modules. So these are all the modules that are either automatically installed when the data is imported 
or modules that you can optionally install after you import. So obviously everything that's grayed out are things that are automatically installed and are required um, to run uh, the system. So you won't be able to access these. The rest are ones that um, you can run and install after uh, import. So if I go back to my post import procedures here, we have those listed in here. So underneath system modules, um, these all don't have to be. Um, these, some of these are just purely optional. So classic requisition approval module, this can be, this must be installed if they are using OnBase. Um, the EIS Classic Integration. Um, this, again, I think we talked about this earlier. Um, you need to have this installed first. And then once you have this installed, then you can go back to the configuration and add in um, their threshold amounts in there. And whether you just want 600 or 500 and 600 object codes. So some of these modules, after they're installed, you then need to go into the configuration and get things set up for them. Um, those configuration options aren't even accessible until the modules are installed first. Um, <clears throat> email notifications, those need to be installed if they want to send reports via email using a job schedule or the report bundles. So obviously, um, Everyone's using report bundles, so this is one of those post import steps that should be done. The file transfer notification services are used for those that use RAM. Uh, the USPS integration module, um, this must be installed in order to post payroll, the board retirement and the board share, so this is a must. User based balance checking module. So this is to be installed if the district wants to control per user the ability to post to negative balances. So if this isn't installed, that simple balance checking area in the user uh, UI isn't displayed. So once we get into user here in a little bit, I'll show you where that's at. And then the other one that can be done um, post import is the Windows Active Directory. So if they're using Active Directory, this needs to be installed. So let me go back and let's talk about some of these here. So when I activate something, um, let's just talk about the other ones that we didn't talk about there on the list. Um, ACH processing module, we don't actively, actively have ACH for redesign vendors yet, but for those that use third-party software like Edge that has ACH, this should be set up. So this would need to be installed. So I'm just going to show an example of how this is done. So when I click on the install module, it tells me that it's been installed, but a very special note here. This change may not take full effect until the page is refreshed. So you have to refresh the page in order for this to actually be activated. So I'll go ahead. <clears throat> and it tells me now, and you'll notice that the plus changed to a minus. So because I use this now, if I go back to core and vendors, I'm going to see the ACH information in there now. And this, like I said, is just for third party. So, but they'll be able to go in, let me just let's pull up one of these. And I've got this ACH information in here now where I can add the ACH information in here. And when checks disbursements get cut, this information is on that disbursement file that they can do an electronic transfer um, using that third party software. So not an actual capability in USASR yet, but it is a capability with third party checks or third party printing of checks. We'll go back to modules. Um, some of these mass change service. Uh, <laughs> um, I think 
for now, I think a lot of ITCs are kind of controlling this um, at just the ITC level. I know that in the past we've had like patches and things that we had you guys do using the mass stream service. We haven't had one of those in a while. Um, but this is kind of like, I know payroll probably uses it more than USAS does, but to me, mass change is kind of like data tree. <laughs> and it could do some really awesome things and it can really screw up things pretty quickly. Um, so we haven't had a lot of mass change procedures in USAS yet, um, but in, or if when we do, you have to install the service first in order to use those mass change steps. So, you know, we'll take this as it goes with the mass change, but for now, until, you know, um, you got, you know, you get instructions from us to have to use the mass change for something, um, I don't think it's really heavily used much in USAS. Um, Pre-encumbrance is another optional one to track your requisitioned amounts, just like we had in Classic underneath the USA Con. This simple balance checking, I'm going to initialize this one as well. So I can show you what it looks like in the user <clears throat> uh, UI when we get to that. And once that gets installed then, like I said, once we get into the user UI, we'll be able to see that information. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? We already have the USPS integration installed and Windows Active Directly. If I went, directory, if I want to install that, I could click on that as well. <clears throat> so while that's moving, which I'm surprised it's taken that long, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, move on to, there we go, click on refresh. Now that's on here as well. So we'll see where this shows up when we actually go in to create a user. We'll be able to see the results of that. Do you guys have any questions about the modules at all? We have the documentation out there as well. So again, if I go back to system, and then modules. Um, like I said, we're working on improving this, but it does have um, the required modules and the optional modules separated out. And then we're slowly building documentation on these. A lot of these you don't even have to worry about. That's why at our, you know, at the ITC staff, we don't have to worry about some of these um, because we, we're not using them a whole lot. Um, but like I said, uh, we will be adding more information on here as we go. Okay. No questions. I'm going to go ahead and move on. And I'm going to skip monitor. That's the last thing we're going to cover because it is pretty technical and it's, but it's also got some useful information for you guys, especially when you're trying to look for something that is causing a problem or after import, if you want to check things out. So we'll leave that for last. Um, I'm going to remap budgets really isn't being used right now, so I'm not even going to cover that. We're going to go to roles. So this is something that, um, you know, most districts, when their user accounts are imported over, if they're a standard user in USAS, they're going to be a USAS standard role in redesign. And so all of that will get pulled over. So their username will get pulled over. They'll, it'll create an account underneath system users with the USAS standard role. The only thing that needs to be redone is passwords. Obviously, those passwords from Classic aren't going to carry over. So those would have to be reset in here. Um, but in here, you can also create custom roles. So they don't have to be limited to what they were in Classic. And so um, this show 
shows you all the different roles that we have out there by default and some that have been created custom. I have no idea what this cash one is. <laughs> it must be something that we created when we were testing something out. Um, but these others, anything that has an underscore um, are SSDT created roles and these cannot be modified. So I can't go into the UCS standard role and try to edit this and say, yeah, I want to move this stuff around um, and get rid of some stuff. You can't do that. Um, but um, you can create a new role using some of those uh, permissions from the standard role. Users can have more than one role. So if you've got a user that you would like them um, to be, maybe they are a USAS uh, rec only, but you also want them to have the capability to view, just view purchase orders, you can give them the USAS rec only role and create a new one. And we'll do that. Purchase order view is what we'll call it. And these are all the available permissions. Um, and so these, most of these are defined in our roles documentation, it tells you what these are all about and what they're used for. Um, we do have some more to add, but we've got a, a pretty decent list of definitions for each of these. So we've got some admin roles, which is really for ITC staff um, or maybe high level people um, that need access to admin type of privileges. We have modules. Um, so this has to do uh, with um, creating things like being, being like the ability to create a rule, uh, things like that. Um, and then we've got all of the USAS ones. So if I just double clicked on this USAS permission, it would give me access to everything starting with USAS. Um, I don't want to do that. I just want purchase orders. So I'm going to go down. I know eventually they'd like to do a filter here where you can type in permission or start typing in permission. It will take you to that section. But for now, you're just going to just scroll down and it's all alphabetized, which is nice. And so I'm basically going into um, UCS purchase orders. And so here's my UCS purchase order section. And so if I were to double click on just UCS purchase orders, I basically have access to all of these. So this is like the parent and these are the children. Um, I want them to be able just to view purchase orders. So I'm just going to click on the view option. If I wanted them to also be able to create a report purchase orders, I would click on the report. But this is all I want them to have access to. And I'm going to click on save. And so what happens then, I could give that requisition user, they're already set up with USAS rec, I'm also going to give them the PO view role so that they have access to just look at POs, which is pretty sweet. So basically when they're logged in, they're going to see underneath the transaction, they're gonna see their requisition access and they're gonna see the purchase order access. And when they look at purchase orders, they're just gonna be able to view them not be able to create or edit or anything like that. So that's basically what a, a role does. <clears throat> and just to show you the documentation that's tied to this, like I said, you know, my goal, part of this, you know, training is to link you to the documentation. So you know where you need to go to get more information about this. So if I go back up to system and then I go to roles, we have tables here of the different SSDT roles. Um, and then we have an example about permissions and we have a brief explanation of the UCSR permissions. It's down here to the bottom of the page, but we can click here to get there quicker. And so these are all the available permissions. So like I said, some of these we still need to fill out, um, but most of these, especially all the UCS ones, We've got, you know, gosh, I lied <laughs> down here. We got a lot of them um, filled out here so that you know what that's going to do. Like if I pick on USAS Activity Ledger, 
This gives them access to the activity ledger query, budget account activity, financial detail reports, and lots of different things. So if you're trying to create a custom role and you're just not quite sure what that permission means, this should help you out. So it gives you the descriptions here. And then we also, if I scroll back up, that's all of these. We also have all the permissions available um, under each of these SSDT roles. So you can see what's included on here. Obviously, you can go into um, the role and, and see them as well, but we also have them labeled in the documentation. So if there's something where you're like, you know, I want to give them USAS read only, what all are they able to do in here? And it shows you all the permissions that are available. So there's my requisition one. So obviously just looking at the USAS rec role, there's no way that they can see a purchase order right now. So that's why I can't modify this because this is the SSDT role, but I can create another role with purchase order view and give them both roles for this particular user. Okay. Any questions about roles? Just at a, you know, just a good note is, you know, when you are preparing a district for migration, that's one question that you want to ask them is, you know, all of your users, what type of access do they have now? And, you know, are there, you know, we do have a way to customize access. So if you do have some people that you want them to only be able to do receipts and see just receipts, we can create that stuff for you. So that's something to mention ahead of time in case they have been wanting that for a long time or they have some kind of private menu set up to limit the access, we can do that same type of thing in the redesign. So just a heads up to kind of give them that information ahead of time so they can kind of figure out what they want to do. And we'll talk about roles some more when we actually go in to create a user and how they uh, connect. Rules. So, when USSR was created, it, um, it came with its own set of required business rules. Um, and then we also have optional rules that the district can enable or disable as they desire. So <clears throat> one thing I could add to my grid here to see those mandatory rules and those bundled rules is to check mark these and put them on there. That way I can filter to see, okay, um, which ones are mandatory. If I do true, these are all the ones that are basically um, already activated and in, in place um, when they start processing and use SR. So upon import, these are mandatory rules that are in here already. Um, the optional ones, I select false, is going to show me ones that you can activate. Um, all of these, I hopefully, the majority of these are um, documented. So if I go back to system and then I go to rules, we talk about down here, the mandatory rules. We have a table of all of those and what they mean. So like I said, these are mandatory and they're bundled. Um, they come with the software is what that means and will be automatically enabled when the data is imported and they can't be disabled. And then we also have our bundled rules that come with the software, but are not mandatory, mandatory in order to use the software. So if you're not quite sure what these rules mean when you're looking at them, we have a description of what those mean. So if there's something that the district would like to activate, um, these are things that you can show them. Like, you know, well, do you want to have an error generated if your disburs disbursement cash account contains a negative balance? Yes. And so in the disbursement module or in the disbursement module, it'll generate an error if I activate this rule. 
So um, these are all the different ones that we have. Now there may be ones in here that, um, or there may be ones that you're wanting to do that aren't an available rule that they can enable. And so that's where custom rules come into play. And we have created some already and added them um, in the documentation that you could basically copy and paste into your district as a custom rule for him for them. So, and so these are ones that we've had questions on. And uh, to be honest, you're first starting writing rules. If you're not real comfortable with it, create a ticket and we'll help you with it. Um, Amanda and I try to attempt them. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. And so we need to go to the developers to help us with it because, you know, look at it. It is definitely more technical. Um, so, but these are some of the custom rules that we created that are not available as an optional rule. But like I said, you can take this information, copy, and paste it into a custom rule for your district. So do we want to require a vendor when they're creating a requisition? We had somebody say they're creating requisitions and we don't like it that um, there isn't a vendor and we want them, we want these requisition users to not be able to create the rec unless a vendor's in there. So we created a rule for that. And so if that's something that your district's interested in, they can copy this or you can copy this and paste it into a rule for them. So if I go back to this and I click on create, basically all that information that was in the documentation, I can just plop in here um, and it's already enabled by default. And when I save it, it'll save it, but it will not activate that rule until I click the activate option. And some people miss that. And they'll say, well, we created a rule, but it's not working. Did you activate it? Uh, no. So um, they just go back in here, click on activate, and um, it'll activate that rule. So these are things, like I said, you know, once you get a district going, um, is to start looking at some of these optional rules and see if, you know, go over these with them, like in a touch base call that you guys have with them. It's one thing that we recommend that you do is like during your migration, you know, after you get districts migrated on, or if you're in the process and you've got, you know, two districts migrated on this month and you're going to do two more next month, you know, have a touch base uh, webinar or something with them um, every month and just say, you know, this is, you know, where we're at. And um, for those of you that have been on, you know, a couple months, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, wanting certain rules to be in place, um, contact us and we'll go through the optional rules that can be installed and show those to you. So just that they know that this stuff's out there, they'll probably wind up asking you while they get comfortable with the system and start processing and say, hey, is there a way, you know, that we can, it can warn us, you know, that a vendor needs to be on the rec before they create the rec. So, yep, that's a rule. So, so those are things, you know, that you may not think about right away when they're migrating, but something to think about after they're on the system. Um, and let them know that these things are available, just like custom fields, you know, let them know once they get comfortable that this stuff's out there. And if they want to start looking into it, you guys can get together and go through that. Okay, any questions about rules? And again, if this is something where you would like a Friday webinar to just to talk about rules some more, put it down in your evaluation. So um, rules or roles or users or how roles and users are played together, you know, um, we can definitely go over a session like that. Okay. Speaking of users, these are all the users that got imported either in, um, or that have been created since then on the redesign. So if you've got security profiles in Classics USA SEC program, those are gonna be imported as users 
in the redesign. So if you're seeing like a bunch of them, you're like, hey, you know, we only have 10 users that process on the system, but we also have 50 users that we've set up profiles and security profile because of this web, things like that, or just to give them access, um, then yeah, uh, those are going to show as user accounts in the redesign. And so you can set up, you know, districts can set up the grid however they want. You guys will probably be in there more than your districts. Um, so let's go in, in and talk about some of these things here. Um, I'm just going to pick on, I'm just going to create one. So I'm going to click on create. And I am a, um, let's say I'm a rec only user who needs views, uh, view to the purchase orders. So I'm going to create a username and it can be whatever you want. Um, so, which is kind of nice. So obviously if I got pulled over from classic, use those names. Don't create a new username for them in the redesign. That's just something more that they have to learn because they're trying to log in using their old classic username and it's now something different. So I would leave those usernames alone. One less thing they have to worry about. Um, but it's up to the district too. If they're not liking their usernames and they want to change them, then by all means, they can be. So I'm just going to call it Michelle. And then if I want an email, great, I can put it on here. Um, and then I've got the roles here. And so I definitely am a USES rec user and I can just double click to move that over. But I want that PO view as well. Um, filters, and Amanda's gonna go through this tomorrow in more detail, but these are the filters that are underneath the utility menu. Um, so this is basically um, the replacement for Classics USA SEC, USA Security Program. And so those filters, like I said, all get you know carried over um, and will be placed in there. So if there's a certain filter that I already created, um, and these names are very horrible on our <laughs> anonymized scrambled data, so I apologize for that, but I'm just gonna do good R, I guess. <laughs> And then we have this option um, for requisition prefixes. So let me talk about what this is for. So um, you can enter in a requisition prefix to be used for auto assign for those users that are doing requisitions. Um, they can't contain any special characters, um, but they can also have multiple prefixes. Um, so what happens when a requisition prefix is entered, it's going to be used um, when that user, um, it's going to be blank. Um, when the user creates a requisition, they just leave the requisition number field blank. And what happens then, let's say my requisition prefix is uh, my initials. So what's going to happen then is I leave that go. And when I create a requisition, I leave the requisition number blank and it's going to sign MRD1 and then just go from there. Um, so it's kind of similar to the way we used to do the auto assigning of rec numbers in Classic. Um, they can also restrict these. So requisition prefixes that can be used when entering recs and are restricting which users uh, um, can what they actually can view. So if I've got that requisition prefix, or I'm sorry, the restrict requisition checked, then um, I have to use, I have to have a requisition prefix entered. And what happens then is when I go in to look at requisitions, only those with that value are going to be displayed. Okay, so if I've got MRD and I've got it restricted to just see MRD related recs, when I go into query recs, I'm only going to see recs that have a prefix of MRD. So if this restrict requisitions is not checked, then the user will be able to use the values that are still in this box, but they'll be able to see all requisitions, 
not just the MRD ones. So it's just a preference of the treasurer and what they want him to see. So that's what this requisition prefix um, box does. The balance checking, that's something that I initialized earlier. Um, I initialized the user-based balance checking module uh, a little bit ago. And because I did that, these balance checking fields appear underneath the user grid. So they can leave them checked or unchecked for the user as to um, what they uh, want them to be able to do. Do we want to be able to allow negative budget amounts when they post this requisition or PO? Do we want them or do we want to stop them at that point and they can't post the purchase order if there's a negative balance? So similar to what we had in USA Security on that first screen. Um, and then some of the other stuff is just miscellaneous information. External authentication has to do with that Windows Active Directory. And other than that, um, there's really not much else to go through here underneath this user account. And so I'm going to test this out. I've got PO view and I've got USAS rec view. And so let's get rid of that for now. And I have no idea what this filter is, um, but we'll go ahead and we'll click on save. Oh, and then, so if I try to do a search for Michelle, I've got Michelle D, oops, I can spell right. And so in here, before I can give somebody the username, I need to set the password. And that's what this option does. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to call it test. Test again to verify it and save it. And when I log out, see what I get. You notice my menu looks very different now because I'm not in admin access anymore. I'm in the access that the roles that were given to me. So in here I can look and see, I just have access to accounts and vendors. Underneath transactions, just like I thought I would, I have access to basically everything in Rex. But if I go to purchase orders, I'm going to be able to see the POs, but I'm only going to be able to view the grid and just do the view. I can't create or invoice or do anything else, just to view them. That's pretty cool how you can just limit, um, you know, based on what, you know, the treasurer's office wants set up as to um, what access they want to grant their users. Okay, any questions about users? Well, we've got 10 minutes and I think I can wrap it up here in 10 minutes with um, the monitor option. That's the only other thing. So let me get back in to my admin access. We've covered all everything but monitor. Okay, and so like I said, I'm going to show you the things that hopefully make most sense to you when you are looking at imports and things like that. And so this is basically stuff that is for you guys or for your tech people. Um, some of this will make more sense to them because they're looking at specific logs for a specific reason. Um, but I'm going to go through some of these tabs. Um, the first one is events. So anytime um, a query is done or something has been written to the system or updated to the system, it's considered an event. So this events tab probably won't mean much to you, probably more to your, um, to probably the SSTT developers and your tech uh, staff. But um, when I click on these different options here, it's got different things that I can look at. And so um, my recent repository events is going to show me what's been done here within the last, I think, what did Mark tell me? 
like the last 200 events. So that could be a, that could be like within the last 20 minutes, you know, it just depends on what people are doing, but it's basically going out there and just looking at things and telling us who did this. And so it's going out here and saying, you know, posting period, get period. And this happened at 318 today at 1151. So by me going in and doing something, it retrieved the posting period to make sure that it's still looking at the correct period. So there's a bunch of different events that you have here. Um, and a lot of this stuff won't mean much to you, um, but it does tell you like who did them. So here's some ones that, you know, I just did when I was logged in as Michelle D. So you can see the ton of um, repository events that it created because I went in and looked at purchase orders. I went into custom, you know, into the custom, well, it pulls in custom fields for some reason. So out of the little time that I was in as Michelle D, it posted a bunch of events on that. So that's basically kind of what that's, that section right here is doing. Um, life cycle events are, I think, your module installations and stuff like that. Any patches that were applied. Um, so again, you can look at the times on these, and they was, these were from four days ago. So um, it's not as busy as those recent events. Um, auditable events. So this, uh, this um, will go back and they contain things about when things were installed or when a uh, payroll posting was done or when a posting period was created, stuff like that. So it has that type of information in there. So those are things, you know, you can kind of look at, but I don't know really how much you're going to be in the events to really pinpoint something, maybe something more that SSDT is looking at to help you with the problem. The status um, is the application's current state. So this is where we're at right now. Um, this is probably something that you may want to look at after importing. Um, to make sure that modules were installed correctly, ledgers were completed. So you kind of want to look at the value. Well, first you off, you want to look at the status here. And then you want to look at the value to see if things have been completed or if something says that it's still running or, or, or something that says that it's not completed, then that's a problem. I think the biggest things up here is this Module state, this is basically the state of the application. This should always say running. And the application instance type, I know I, I'm exactly in the production, the most recent live version of um, the application. So that should always say production when you're looking at a district's um, information. Um, and so down here, just some of the things, and these were all done upon import. This test import was done back in February. And so these are some of the things. The activity ledger, was that completed? The encumbrance ledger, was that installed? Um, expenditure, the GL journal, those things that we looked at um, under module and under configuration, were those things all completed? So, and then we've got some information down here too about things that have been installed. Was the payable module installed? The revenue, true, 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 true. So those are good things. To see anything that's showing false or showing that it didn't complete, those are things that we need to be concerned about. Metrics. Um, this is really for ITC staff. Um, heap information and database threads and that stuff's on there. So we fortunately do not have to worry about that too much. I'm just going to blow right by that one. Um, logging. Again, I think um, from what, you know, talking to our project managers, this is more something that the developers look at in case there's an issue with something and nothing that we really need to worry about too much. Um, so this is something if you've got a situation and we have access to your instance, um, then this is something we might look into. Now the application log um, is something that uh, we use, SSDT used in debug issues. Um, so, you know, we kind of look at this to see if there was a problem. Um, 
you know, or you guys got some kind of weird error when they tried to process something, we go into the application log to see what's going on. So if you get some kind of weird error when you're trying to create a vendor or something like that, that could be recorded here in the application log and we can take a look and see what's going on with that. So it's nice to see, you know, the different levels. This is an error, this is an info, stuff like that. And you can see that, you know, it's updated, you know, as of now. So it's got all this information on here. So what's nice is we have this filter row that we can sort, um, or I'm sorry, or filter by what we think it might be. So if you're trying to figure it out on your own um, first to see, I think it might be a problem with this um, because I found it in the application log, that's great. You can let us know and then um, we can figure out uh, what's going on. Um, here's the one I just did where I tried to create the user ID, Michelle, and it already exists. I get an error. And so this basically is telling me that's why. Um, you know, that it already existed. It was helpful too when I, um, you know, tried to create that user and it already said it existed, but some of those errors aren't very user friendly. This might help us out a little bit more by looking at the application log. Uh, threads, again, not useful for us, more for the tech staff or for um, the SSDT developers. The admin log. Oh, it's missing. This is the import log. Well, that's a bummer. Let me get to this other one. <laughs> it's missing. It's always good to have a backup instance in case something like this happens. Uh, let me go down the monitor. Let's see if there's an app log here. I really need to work about that. Oh boy, not there either. I'm not quite sure, but this is the import log that gets generated upon import is in here. So this is going to show you, um, kind of scroll through this to make sure that the import errors and warnings are all listed in here. Um, we do have an import error and warning uh, place in the documentation that talks about this and talks about the common import errors, but all of those errors would show up underneath this admin log. I am so sorry. I don't know why these aren't in here. They should be. Yeah, if you go to one of your districts, they better have an admin, an admin log because it's their import log. It's one that gets created upon import. Um, the info tab, um, again, this is stuff about Docker um, and more technical information. Um, sometimes performance issues, um, the developers can take a look at this to look at um, why it may be slow. And the last one is your server log. So um, there could be a lot of different ones on here. It just depends. I'm going to go back to my other instance. This server log stuff. So. Okay, great. So I just want to talk about some of these. And some of these we will document too, just so you know. But like this download JULI one, call it the Julie log. Um, this is internal logging for Apache. So if we can't figure this out, the Tomcat um, server will. So that's something, again, that's more technical in nature. Um, as well as the local host and the manager ones, these are all Tomcat log uh, information. Um, the Catalina, again, is also um, Tomcat information. So if there is an error related to the Tomcat server, it would be underneath this. Um, this the USAS um, web docker, um, this is the current application log. So this is very similar to what you're seeing in the app log. So it's basically the same thing, but you can pull it up through here. And then the local, so, and you can see there might be various versions from various days of that same one. So this version from the 14th, 15th, 16th. Same thing with the local host. Um, these are Tomcat logs to show querying or um, hosting information. So basically these local host ones, and you could see various versions, is how the UI communicates with the back end. So this might even be helpful with third parties um, 
So this is again something more on the technical end. So really, you know, you're getting the app log um, is really like this UCS web docker, this, the app log, and underneath about the server log are probably the ones that we would request or want to look at if there's an issue. Um, sometimes we will tell you guys, SSDT will ask you to send the server log to the SSDT, and that's basically going underneath help about and posting this. Um, that will be sent to us. Now that a lot of you are on those automated backups, um, we can get a lot of that information already, unless we need the true import log, not the one that you get from the admin log, but the true import log that has, at the admin log takes that import log and makes it look a little more appealing in here, but sometimes the programmers want the more thorough, longer import log, and so they'll be asking for that in a ticket as well in case we need to look for that. So that's kind of the monitor status in a nutshell. Um, so like I said, these aren't things to really worry yourself about, especially the monitor one. Um, we, it's probably a big enough issue that you're contacting us to get some help on. And so we're probably looking at these things and our developers are looking at these things more than what you guys are. So at this point, you know, you're just getting people or districts migrated on. You're not too worried about this stuff. So, and I get it. Um, any questions about the system menu? I don't think I've had one question. <laughs> All right, well. We, it's 12.05, so I've gone over five minutes here, but uh, we did cover everything that we needed to today. Um, tomorrow, Amanda's gonna start off with the utilities and go through that, and also um, the reports. And then I'm just gonna wrap things up at the end of tomorrow, just talking about some miscellaneous things, not much. Um, she's got most of the um, presentation for tomorrow. So if you guys don't have any further questions, um, oh, I did get one question here. Um, can you tell me when the recordings will be on the web page? Yes, we're hoping to get all three posted by Friday. So we'll have all three of them out there by Friday. Um, so you can look that up. Uh, we already have the payroll ones from last week posted. So we'll get all the um, USAS ones out there by Friday. And uh, guys don't have any other questions. Thanks for attending today. Thanks for taking the time um, to sit through this this morning. We really appreciate it. And we will see you guys all back here tomorrow at 9. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle.